Thanks, Martin, for joining me today um, to talk to the class about um, the influenza pandemic in 1918 to 1919. I just wondered if you could start by introducing um, yourself and what you do at the London School of Economics. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Martin Bailey. I'm, I'm an academic. That means that I do teaching and research in a university, uh, which is kind of like a school for young adults. Um, and it's where you, know, you might go um, once you've finished your schooling. Thank you. And why are you talking to me about the influenza pandemic today? Well, some of the research that we've done recently has been looking into uh, the history of pandemics. Um, and the hope is that we can understand more about this present coronavirus pandemic by looking at uh, pandemics in the past. And uh, the one that I'm going to talk to you about today is obviously the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic that hit London and the rest of the UK, but also um, was a global pandemic. So it, it impacted all around the world. Uh, that's interesting. It impacted all around the world. So it, it came to London, didn't it? Where, where do you think, where did it come from exactly? Well, we don't fully know, but some recent medical research has suggested that it may have started um, in parts of America uh, and then been transported over to Europe um, by troops, uh, soldiers who were fighting in the First World War, which was going on at the same time. Um, so we think that one of the reasons it spread so uh, widely was in fact because uh, a lot of countries were sending their soldiers to many different parts of the world and the soldiers were transporting the virus uh, with them. Oh, that's interesting because at the time people thought that it was caused by bacteria didn't they? They didn't realise that there were things like viruses that we realise today. Um, why, why was that? I mean what, what, what's the difference between understanding that something's a virus and something's bacteria? Well, you have to remember that at this time, uh, medical science, that is uh, the science that we use to understand diseases um, that doctors use to treat patients, uh, medical science wasn't very uh, well developed. And some of the things that they thought about this disease were actually wrong. So um, around about the time of the pandemic, this was a period where there had been lots of discoveries of different types of bacteria um, that helped cure a lot of diseases, including smallpox. Now, a bacteria is different from a virus. It, it, it functions differently. It, it attacks the body in different ways. Um, so people mistakenly thought that the Spanish flu was another type of bacteria and that it could be treated with things like antibiotics, when in fact, uh, what was needed was um, uh, a vaccine that would uh, tackle the virus. That's really interesting because there weren't any public health warnings at first for it, were there? But they had put some out for measles, I think, in 1915, which was understood. They understood how measles spread a bit more, didn't they? But they weren't quite sure how this spread. Um, is that right? Yes. I mean, they thought they knew how it spread um, and they thought because it was a bacterium that if um, houses were clean and if streets were clean, um, then that would help prevent its spread. But as we know, a virus spreads through coughing, through droplets in the air, through contact and so on. Um, so the health messages that they sent out weren't initially uh, at the start, they weren't very helpful. Um, and some of the health messages were quite strange, really. Uh, they included things like um, gargling, that means sort of drinking a little bit of water, with a bit of um, salt and some chemicals because they thought that if you cleaned your throat that would help you get better because of course they thought it was a bacterium something that we need to just clean out of our of our body um, but that wasn't going to work in fact some people even thought that it would work um, if adults drank uh, whiskey for example and alcohol um, and this wasn't very helpful at all so yeah that's interesting because you also talked about the influenza spreading through the movement of soldiers you know lots of people coming and going from america obviously to europe to fight in the war and you'd think i mean did, did people understand that it was coming through the soldiers and if they did i mean why was there no anger about them at that time well the soldiers uh, had been fighting 
uh, the First World War since 1914. Um, and, and, and the war looked like it was coming to an end. Um, and the soldiers were viewed very much as heroes. Uh, and so the, the public um, people uh, in society were very uh, reluctant. They weren't, they weren't willing to blame the soldiers because they saw them as, as having fought the war for their countries. Um, but it's also the fact that at the time, people just didn't really understand how, how the virus was being spread. So um, they couldn't fully blame the soldiers, uh, even, even if they wanted to, because they just didn't fully understand its spread. And do you think that because of the war and so many people had died already, particularly soldiers, um, that people were sort of, they were, you, you described in the report people being normalised and by that, that means people are, are used to sudden death, people are used to people dying. I mean, do you think this was more of the case at the time than, than say today? Um, obviously we don't have a war on, but, mm. but actually we're not used to people dying in the same way, are we? Yeah, I think that's right. And other historians who have looked at uh, the 1918 Spanish flu have, have made this point that they feel as though um, society at that time had experienced uh, the deaths of hundreds of thousands and millions of soldiers in the First World War. So, so death was something that these communities were very much used to. Um, it's also the case that because of the war, uh, a lot of people uh, were struggling for food. Um, they had been working very hard. They were they were malnourished. That means that they hadn't they hadn't got enough supply of food, and so they were quite weak. Um, and this meant that a lot of people were were more likely to get ill. Uh, and so, in a way, uh, the death of people by um, by these kind of diseases was was perhaps more common then. It's also worth remembering that they called the Spanish flu an influenza. It was a type of flu, as we call it now, which is a type of virus. But every year, um, the country had experienced influenza. So a lot of people just thought that this was a, a particularly bad year um, for flu, uh, not that it was a, an entirely new disease. Uh, that's, that's interesting, because who had, I mean, the who were the doctors? I mean, did everybody have access to a doctor? Or, I mean, was the, was the government, did they have a health service like we have today? Um, what happened? There was no national health service at this time. And in fact, there was no health ministry. So that is uh, the section of the government that's responsible for the health of the public. These days we have a Department of Health, which is a health ministry, which is responsible for running the NHS. But that health ministry was actually didn't wasn't invented until after the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu actually taught the government they needed one central government department that would be responsible for public health. And because there was no NHS, the NHS didn't begin until after the Second World War in 1945. Uh, because there was no NHS, then people didn't have their own doctors the way that you might go and see your own doctor um, today. Uh, and so particularly people who didn't have enough money um, may not have access to medical treatment. Um, and the, the overall sort of uh, provision, that is the availability of a doctor, uh, was quite limited. So that did that mean there could be differences between different towns like so London could have a different health kind of system to Manchester for example is, is that what happened? Right so the way that health public health was managed at this time was through what were called local government boards so big cities and big towns would have their own local government board who would be responsible for the health of the people living in that area and that responsibility fell sometimes on doctors uh, sometimes on charities um, and sometimes even on schools. So lots of different organisations were responsible um, for the health of the general public. So there was no um, central government authority who was uh, responsible for this. And this is important because it meant that different local government boards, uh, different local kind of health organisations, um, gave different advice to people on how to deal with uh, with the influenza. Uh, so 
we can say, and, and something that we've, we've found through our research, uh, is that the way that the pandemic was uh, uh, dealt with was very decentralized. So there was no, like the prime minister um, these days, for example, there was no single figure saying, this is how we are going to do things. Um, lots of different cities and towns had all of their different approaches. So does that mean people realized actually how prevalent, how, how much of a hold the flu had and, you know, and how many people were dying and how many people were getting sick? I mean, was this reported in the newspaper reports or, or was there still, because I know there was, you know, they didn't report everything because of the wars, but was that still going on as well? Yeah, I mean, because of the war, um, the reporting, particularly of deaths of soldiers, uh, was not allowed. Um, this was something that the government tried to prevent because they thought it would be bad for morale. That is, um, they thought it'd be bad for the, the sort of spirit of the country that if they knew that lots of soldiers were dying, then they might panic. And remember, this was towards the end of the war as well. So they were very keen for the war um, to, to come to an end. Um, the reporting of deaths, rather like the way that public health was organized, was also quite decentralized. So national newspapers would report the deaths in the country, but it was very common in those days for people to read their local newspapers. So what this meant is you would read how many people had died perhaps in your local area and then you might get some reports of um, people who were dying in other parts of the country but these days as you probably know we have these big press conferences that the government gives and sometimes um, different uh, members of the government will will tell the country how many people have died across the country in different areas and, and you'll be able to see how many um, people are dying across time that sort of data wasn't available in 1918. It was available later on, um, and that's how we can look at the histories of this pandemic. Um, but it wasn't widely reported uh, on a national level at the time. That's, that's interesting because it makes me wonder about how people remembered it then in that case, because obviously you might know the local story. So we've heard from a survivor of the flu who talked about it in her area in Yorkshire and everybody was just waiting for it to come to them, essentially, the sense that you were going to get it. But she didn't necessarily have the idea that everybody around the country had the same feeling, if you see what I mean. So it's, I wonder how people remembered it because we obviously, we still mark remembering the First World War, but we don't seem to remember the pandemic, if you see what I mean. So did people remember it? And did the government mark it in any way afterwards, given so many people died and got ill? One of the very strange things about our research is that we found that there was there was no memorial to the Spanish flu. Unlike um, the war memorials that we see around the country and the fact that on the 11th of November every year, we have Armistice Day where we remember um, all of those who have died in the wars over the years. Uh, there doesn't seem to have been any uh, memorial to the Spanish flu um, in this country, despite the fact that it killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people um, and in fact all around the world it's very unusual for countries to uh, remember pandemics and viruses. There's one exception to this that we've been able to find which is New Zealand, um, a country near Australia uh, where they actually did have a memorial to, um, to those people who have died but that seems to be the exception. And we think that this is quite strange. Um, and we think that there's something about uh, diseases and viruses um, that, that leads people not to memorialize that um, or to memorialize them, that is to remember them. Um, and we think that our research suggests that this might be a problem because when um, pandemics come around every sort of uh, few decades, um, the lessons from the last one aren't remembered so well because we don't uh, memorialize them like we do wars. So one of the findings of our research is we should perhaps think about ways to remember this pandemic more effectively so that future generations will be uh, better prepared to deal with them. Okay, thank you very much for talking to me. Um, that's really useful. Thank you. Thanks.